Good afternoon. I'm Simone Cavallaro, Director of the Studio Center. Today, we're happy to host Professor Thomas Piketty and Robert Topel for a conversation moderated by Ed Luce um, on Professor Piketty's new book, Capital and Ideology, and COVID-19 and the Implication for Inequality in Capitalism. The new book is available for purchase from the seminary co-op. Please see the event description for link and more information. Before we begin, please note, we are on the record and live streaming to the Sticker Center YouTube channel. If you have any questions for the speakers, we will address them at, at the, uh, in the last 15 minutes. So you can submit them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. As usual, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. You, we hope you will join us for more upcoming webinars. So please check out our website, our podcast Capital Isms and promarket.org, the Stigler Center's publication, which was just redesigned last week. Back to this afternoon, please allow me to introduce our speakers. Thomas Piketty is a professor at the Paris School of Economics and director of studies at EHESS. He is also co-director of the World Inequality Lab and the World Inequality Database, and one of the initiators of the Manifesto for the Democratization of Europe. He has done major work on the interplay between economic development, the distribution of income and wealth, and political conflict. And he's the author of the international bestseller, Capital in the 21st Century, among others. Robert Topel is the Isidore and Gladys Brown Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at Booth. He is also the co-director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. His research areas include labor, health and energy economics, industrial organization, and antitrust, business strategy, and public policy, among others. He has held visiting and research position at the Federal Reserve, the World Bank, Brand Corporation, and more. Our moderator today is Ed Luce, the Financial Times US National Editor and Columnist. Previously, he was the FT's Washington Bureau Chief, and before that, the speechwriter for Treasury Secretary Larry Summers in the Clinton administration. He's also author of three highly acclaimed books and appears fre frequently in the media. And now, without further ado, I turn it out over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shimone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be at the Stigler Center, at least virtually. I was greatly looking forward to coming and attending your conference physically, but uh, hopefully next year. Um, this is a, a hugely important and very topical um, subject that we're going to be discussing today around capital and ideology, Thomas Piketty's new book. But of course, in the context of COVID-19 and all the expected and already visible impacts of this pandemic, on inequality um, in our societies. So I think what we're going to do is uh, ask each uh, in turn of Thomas and then Robert just to talk for five minutes, Thomas to outline capital and ideology and, talk, and Robert to respond and then we'll get into uh, questions about 35 minutes of questions and I'll leave about a, a quarter of an hour for Q&A from the audience, which I'll pick up on the screen. So Thomas, um, congrats on your book and let's start with you. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for, for inviting me. You know, of course, I would have much preferred to be here in Chicago to, to have this debate, but you know, let's, let's do what we can in the current circumstances. So I'm supposed to try to summarize a, a book of over 1000 pages in five minutes, which, you know, of course, is, uh, is not uh, completely obvious, but le let me show you a few slides. I don't know if you can, if you can see them, uh, where you know, I, I try to summarize what, what I do in this book. So, you know, in this talk, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm not really gonna present some of the figures and tables of this book. Let, let me simply say that, you know, this book, First of all, you know, I'm, I'm sorry it's a bit long. Uh, some people don't like uh, very long books, but you know, I think it's very readable. It can be read by any uh, 
one uh, uh, interested in the history of, uh, of human societies. This is again a book about the history of inequality over time and across societies. As compared to my previous book, Capital in the 21st Century, well, first, I think it's much better. In the, it's, uh, you know, my previous book had many limitations. This one certainly has many limitations as well, but, uh, you know, I think I'm making progress, in particular in, in two directions. So my, my previous book was too much Western-centered, and this one devotes a lot more attention than the previous one on, on outside the West, basically. So I'm looking at India, looking at China, looking at uh, colonial uh, colonialism and its impact on, on, on global inequality structure, looking at Brazil, South Africa, uh, Haiti. So t taking a much, much broader perspective than just Western Europe and North America, which was sort of the, very much the center of my previous book. And also the, the other major difference is that this, this new book puts emphasis on uh, uh, ideology and, and, and change in political beliefs about inequality and about how to organize the economy as the really key uh, driving force uh, behind changes in inequality. So the key you know, message and takeaway of the book is, is, is really to stress that uh, uh, for a given level of economic development and technological development, there are always many different ways to organize uh, society, to organize the economy, and, and, and the level and the structure of inequality in a given society is primarily determined by, by, by by, by you know political and ideological uh, choices, and I, I, I you know I try to revisit the history of inequality through this uh, perspective. So let me describe very quickly you know the contents of the book, so that you know if you if you never have a chance to open the book, at least you have a, a chance to see a little bit the, the organization of the book. The, the book is more or less chronological. You know it starts with what I describe as uh, uh, ternary societies or trifunctional societies that were societies organized typically with a, 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 a nobility uh, in charge of law and order, a clerical class in charge of spiritual guidance, uh, education, and to, to some extent uh, uh, health as well, uh, and, and a third uh, estate, a third group in societies uh, uh, that was uh, that was in particular providing a raw uh, labor. And in the first part of the book, I, I describe uh, the transformation from this kind of societies to what I describe as ownership societies in the 19th century, uh, in particular with the uh, case of the, of the French Revolution in, in, in France, but you know, I also look at other uh, uh, European uh, trajectories, uh, uh, and, and of course to the US uh, case with the particular dimension of, you know, of course, uh, slavery playing a, a specifically important role in the case of the, of the US. But just staying in, in the, the Europe for a minute, uh, you know, I show how, uh, you know, at the same time, you have an attempt to develop more equal uh, rights, in particular in terms of rights in access to property, independently of, of your former status or whether you belong to the nobility or not. But on the other hand, there's actually very limited access in terms of effective access to property rights in the 19th century. And you have, if anything, you know, very large and, and to some extent even growing concentration of wealth during the 19th century in European societies pretty much until until World War One, and I, I try to study how the, it's, you know, as if you have a sort of new religion about property in the 19th century, a, a quasi-sacralization of property, which I illustrate in particular with the case of the, uh, the you know, at the time of the abolition of slavery, and, and, and more generally in all the colonial accumulation of wealth and power, but in the time of the abolition of slavery, there is a full compensation uh, toward uh, uh, slave owners rather than a compensation to slaves, largely because there's a fear, uh, you know, at the time that if you start questioning this particular kind of property rights, uh, then you will, uh, you know, you will end up with questioning the entire system of property, and, and so this prevents uh, these societies from, from doing compensation to, to slaves or not compensating slave owners, but this also prevents these societies from 
trying to develop uh, progressive uh, taxation and redistribution of wealth, things start to change uh, at the beginning of the 19th century and early 20th century. I, I stress the importance of slave and colonial societies in this overall evolution. So part two is very much about slave societies, abolition of slavery, and also colonialism, where you, know, the, the, you have a, a, a lasting impact on the overall structure of inequality. The case of India is, is particularly emblematic because the, the way, uh, in particular, British colonialism contributed to give a specific meaning to the uh, caste categories through the colonial uh, censuses, and, 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 and this is something that still has a huge uh, uh, impact in the inequality structure in India today. And over and beyond the case of India, you know, you have forced labor in West Africa in French colonies until uh, pretty much after World War II. So this is, of course, uh, you know, something that has a very lasting impact on, on inequality uh, structure. Then part three and part four of the book look more at the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. So part three of the book is about this huge reduction of inequalities that happened during the 20th century, which I, I really stress that, uh, you know, in the, the book, I, I should say, you know, as, as, as I tries to have a very sort of optimistic uh, flavor in particular about the long run evolution. You know, I stress that in the long run, you know, you have a process of reduction of inequality, in particular since the beginning of the since the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And even though there's been an increase in inequality in recent decades, you, know, you have a long run evolution toward more equality, in particular, more equal access to education, which has been very uh, positive, uh, both in terms of uh, equality, mobility, and also economic growth and economic uh, prosperity. Uh, so I, I look at this in part three of the book. And, and in part four of the book, I, I look at you know, somehow what, what were the main limitation of social democratic societies starting in the 1980s, 1990s, how the, the electoral coalitions that was built in after World War II uh, uh, around social democratic parties, broadly speaking, uh, eroded gradually and how the, the, these parties sort of became what I call in the book the Brahmin left parties, uh, 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 by which I mean that they have, uh, uh, you know, they used to attract uh, uh, relatively lower uh, class, uh, lower educated, lower income voters in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and gradually, you know, they have left um, uh, support from these voters and they have become mostly voters of the, of the most highly educated group, which I try to account uh, in a fairly detailed manner in the book, comparing uh, many countries. You know, this is an issue on which a lot has been written, but very often we tend to concentrate only on the US or only on Europe or only, and you know, I, I think it's really important to look at this in a broader perspective. And basically, I argue that, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, mostly the, 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 the fact that in, in terms of education policy in particular, and more generally in terms of economic policy and how you deal with globalization, these parties sort of abandon uh, the kind of ambitious redistributive perspective that they had. Uh, uh, in the in the three or four decades after after World War II, and then you know I describe uh, new elements for what I, I call a participatory socialism in the 21st century, which some people will prefer to call social democracy. You know, be aware of the fact that in many countries, you know, social democratic parties and socialist party uh, uh, are, are, are synonymous. Uh, it may not be the case in the US, so you know, you can choose your own uh, words if you prefer. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, what, what matters, I think, is to push, you know, again, this agenda based on educational equality and about the uh, sort of rebalancing of of property rights with the rights of workers, uh, the rights of consumers, the right of local government, and a, a more equal uh, distribution of wealth and economic power, which, which has been, again, a big success in the, in the 20th uh, century. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go any further. If you go to this website, uh, pkt.psc.ens.fr slash ideology, you will find the full slides presentation. You know, there are you know, 50 slides, 60 slides. There's also a version with 200 slides. You know, if you want to see 
all the 169 figures and tables that are in the book. It's a very data intensive book. There's, you know, no, you know, I'm not going to try showing you any data, but if there is a specific question that calls for a particular, uh, uh, you know, data answer, I will maybe I will, I will show one of the uh, one of the slides. Uh, I guess I have already talked for too long. So, I'm, I'm, uh, but if you want to give me one or two more minutes, I can use it, but maybe it's better if okay, I stop. No, not, yeah. not right now. Yeah, that, um, since, since it is a 1200 page book, I will forgive you for going double over length. That was 10 minutes, but I can okay, understand why. <laughs> Thank you for that summary of your book. Robert, um, you haven't just bought out a 1200 page book, but you are responding to one, but do nevertheless try and keep your response to Thomas to, to five minutes. I'll do my best. Thank Let's you. get myself shared here. All right. So um, I assume you guys can see that screen now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks for having me. And uh, uh, Tomas's is, is book is extremely interesting and very long. So let me make sure. And now my here. There we go. So the central idea of the book is that uh, inequality has been rising. And in, to in Tomas's view, and in that of many others, that's not a good thing. Um, he views that inequality, though, as it's not economic or technological, it's ideological and political. And that's, that's exactly the way he phrases it. So he, he, the, 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 the book is allegedly, in fact, is built on a sequence of facts, um, though I find those facts to be fairly incomplete and in many ways misleading. Um, his facts are that within country inequality has risen, risen virtually worldwide. And the main culprit is declining pro progressivity in, in tax regimes, that the tax rates on the very rich are too low. And when that's combined with, with a, a, a form of, of market economy that he calls hypercapitalism, bad things ensue. So in his view, market forces, I, I, I want to be careful about saying his view. What comes through in the book, market forces played a minor role, if any, in the evolution of inequality. Um, the, the, his view is that marginal, high marginal rates don't hamper growth. And repeatedly through the book, he refers back to the, uh, a sort of golden age, if you will, of the 1950s and 1960s where at least the statutory rates in the United States and Great Britain were very high. You all remember the Beatles song about the tax man. Um, yet economic growth was allegedly higher than it is today. So I just, as I note in that bullet point there, I just saved you a thousand interesting but somewhat misleading pages. His, his new solution or his solution is a new brand of socialism with high, highly progressive taxes, uh, taxes on wealth that transcends the nation state. Um, countries that fail to participate are gonna face extreme sanctions and that's how it's all going to work. Your taxes are gonna be determined not just within the polity within, within which you live, but by a collection of such polities. So, his, here's some basic facts that I think are important to understand about the operation of so-called hypercapitalism after 1970. First, worldwide inequality declined in the markets and economic development. Second, worldwide poverty declined dramatically. Billions of people escaped ex extreme poverty. It's lower than at any point in recorded human history and, it, and health greatly improved around the world. As the president of the World Bank said, it's one of the greatest human achievements of our time. In the US and other developed countries, inequality between men and women steadily declined. Pre-tax income and wealth inequality steadily increased. That's the main uh, theme of this book. Uh, but post-tax and transfer income and consumption inequality actually rose by much less. Now, those facts aren't due to ideology or the failure of a, of a tax system to tax very high incomes. I'm going to argue that they're driven by technology and market forces that favor highly skilled people relative to less skilled people. And the supply of skills for a variety of institutional reasons that create the problem 
have not kept pace. So the high marginal rates of the 50s and 60s were in fact a chimera. The rich didn't pay them and the government didn't collect more revenue in those days. It was about seven and a half percent in the United States, seven and a half percent of revenue came from personal taxation in the 50s and 60s and seven and a half percent was collected in the, in the uh, 80s and 90s. The high growth that occurred in that period was due to other factors such as recovery from World War II and a lot of people's capital stocks have been destroyed. So the basic question is this, is rising income inequality due to reduced taxation of the super rich, as, which is a central theme of this book. And I, say, I would say that to propose a solution to the problem of rising inequality, you have to understand the problem in the first place. So my first point is, I'm gonna have the same thing three times. It ain't taxes, ain't is a word taken from the French, which means in many ways, it ain't so. Supply and demand, the rise in returns to education. Let's take a look at what happened to the returns to education in the United States, but I could show this in a number of Western countries. So if it, the, the, this graph shows you the evolution of the ratio of college graduates, people with 16 years of education and postgraduate degrees, more than 16 years of education, over from 1963 up until our dad ended in 2012. And the thing you notice is that the returns to education went way up. So we're not talking about people at the very top of the wage distribution or the income distribution or the wealth distribution. We're talking about people like most of the people watching this, this show um, that are college graduates or people with postgraduate degrees. And you'll notice that you know, relative to where they were in 1980, coincidentally, right about the time that I entered the labor market as a young assistant professor, the returns to education went way up. In fact, they roughly doubled over time for both college graduates and for uh, people with postgraduate degrees. And I indexed them to 1979 just to demonstrate that point, that the evolution of the returns to education compared to a high school graduate have, been, have steadily increased over time and it's, it's a pretty dramatic increase. The premium roughly doubled for, for all of them. And a doubling of the returns to an investment like education, an investment in human capital, is a, is a big deal. Now, you'd expect that when the returns went up, people tried to invest and get the thing that's become more valuable, in this case, a college degree. And if you follow cohorts over time in the United States, where a cohort means a high school cohort at age 18 and ask what fraction of them have at least one year of schooling, well, it looks like they're responding to incentives. The, incentive, the returns went up and more people went on to get at least one year of college. So that's, it looks like it's kind of good news that the supply of human capital is gonna keep up with the rising demand as measured by the returns. However, this, the, this graph shows you what's happened over the entire century from 1920 up until roughly today. And you'll, you'll note that for men um, uh, with four years who, with, who have graduated from college, and this is done again by cohort, that fraction of each population, fraction of the population of each cohort was rising steadily over time until around the mid 1960s and 70s. Then it dipped which is reflective of coming out of the Vietnam War. But the main point is it stalled after 1980. It stalled around 30% of the population of, of, of young men in the United States. Whereas women have continued to go, uh, continued to have increasing education. Uh, there, a larger fraction of women, in fact, complete four years of college than men. But the point there is that supply did not keep up with the rising demand. And that's why the price went up. And that's why so many of us who are fortunate to be in the class of educated people earn so much more than we did in the past. Now, the second part of this argument, that it's the market, is that this inequality, didn't, it, this rise in inequality didn't just happen for college graduates and people with postgraduate degrees. And it didn't happen for people at the, just at the top of the wage distribution. This shows average weekly wages uh, by percentiles of the wage distribution 
from 1960, again, 1963, up until the mid-2000s, and uh, uh, mid-2010s. And you'll notice that the most rapid growth was at the top. And if I've been able to show you the 99th percentile and the 99.9th percentile, they would be going way up as well. So the, the point there is that at the bottom of the wage distribution, there's been very little uh, real earnings growth, real wage growth at all. But at the top, there's been quite a bit. That's rising inequality. But it's not just, it's not in the, it's not a return to people at the very top. It's not the Jeff Bezoses and stuff. They've all prospered. They've gotten super rich, it's true, but this is something that's going on throughout the wage distribution. Another way of looking at that is this. This shows wage growth by over uh, the period from 1973 up into 1970 to 72 up to 2012 by percentiles of the wage distribution. And to simplify, though, well, there are some wiggles in there. Every percentile of the wage distribution, of the skill distribution, think of it that way, did better in terms of wage growth than the percentile below it. It's a steady increase across the wage distribution. So most wage growth took place at the top. The more skilled, the rich, if you will, got richer and the people at the bottom did not. The other point to notice though, is that throughout at every percentile of the wage distribution for women, women's wages grew faster than for men. So that's the point I made earlier about convergence of earnings and earning power of women relative to men. Inequalities increase for both groups throughout the wage distribution. It's not simply a, a story of the top. The 40th percentile did better than the 35th percentile, the 35th percentile did better than the 30th, and so on. It's market forces that are behind this. And just to emphasize the point, uh, Robert, we, we're getting way over length here. Could, 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 you, um, could you finish up, please? Yeah, yeah. Just to emphasize the point, as earnings went, as earning power went up, as wages rose, the people who end up working more at the top of the wage distribution were their returns to work. And I'll just show the point of the last slide. The same market forces affect superstars, the top 1%, and you and me. It's not something that's just concentrated at the top. And I give some examples here of the superstar earnings that have occurred. For example, if you look at professional soccer, which will make it more accessible to everybody who is a European listening in. In 1970, Pele made $144,000 or a little less than a million. Today, Lionel Messi makes 127 million, which is 135 times uh, in real terms what Pele was making for a growth annual growth rate of 10.5%. That's huge. And that was driven by technology and a change in market circumstances, not a change in the tax system. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you some questions. Since, since you've both ruthlessly ignored my five minute um, time limit, I'm going to ruthlessly interrupt where necessary from now on. Um, uh, Thomas, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, let me just start by asking you one question about the sort of foundation of it, ideology, capital and ideology. You, um, your thesis is, is what Paul Krugman said in his review of your book, is basically Marx turned on its head. Marx said that technology and economic structure determines the ideology. You're saying ideology determines the economic structure and technology. Now, just picking up from what Robert was just talking about, the superstar effect, um, the winner takes all phenomenon that we've been seeing um, in, in recent years, uh, and which is increasing um, on steroids during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, uh, surely that's technology that's, in, in, it, that's having an impact on a direct primal impact on the distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. And surely there are other factors like uh, market concentration, mm. um, like the lack of antitrust action, um, or indeed trade, that, that, are, that are just as important as, as ideology. Could you answer that sort of Krugman criticism? Mm. 
Yeah, well, so, you know, first of all, let, let me say very clearly to, to Robert that, you know, I, I fully agree that uh, education and, uh, you know, supply of education and demand of education is very important and it plays a huge role in my, my book. I'm really sorry if you did not see that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that my book is so long, uh, uh, but, you know, it, it plays a very big role. And, but, but calling this market forces, uh, you know, I think it's another issue. You know, I think the educational system and the choice the political choices we make about how we organize our educational system, our legal system, uh, our antitrust policies. I mean, this is absolutely uh, critical. And, and, you know, again, I have nothing against everything you've shown about wages and education premium, you know, that's perfectly fine. I know this very well, you know, no problem at all. But here you're looking you know, at, a, at a very small angle of the much bigger picture that I look at, you know, over a much longer period of time, and where you see huge transformation, in particular, of the educational system. So let me remind you, you know, the, the, the US as a country, you know, was uh, an economic leader during uh, most of the 20th century, largely because it was an educational leader. So, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, indeed, you had, you know, 90% of the, of, the, of the generation in the US going to high school at a time when it was 20 or 30% in Western Europe and Japan. Now, this educational leadership has ceased since the 1980s. And if we want to understand first why there was this educational leadership to begin with and why it ended, you obviously have to look about, you know, all the, well, the ideology, generally speaking, the politics of education, and, and that's what I'm talking about, is that all these institutions, you know, they are, they are man-made, you know, they, are, they depend on, on different uh, uh, belief system about what we should do uh, uh, with, uh, you know, in this case, with, uh, with the education system. So, you know, let, let me maybe stress, you know, just to stress the role of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, policy and change, uh, you know, if I, I, I don't know if you can, if you can see, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just to, to try to have a, uh, a, you know, dialogue a little bit with Robert, because again, you know, everything you've shown, Robert, uh, I, I don't see any disagreement with you. Let, let me simply say, uh, you know, education, if you look, uh, uh, first, if you look at effective tax rate in the U.S., okay, so these are, you know, effective tax rate, because uh, you mentioned something which was that there was no uh, more tax progressivity in the U.S. in the middle of the 20th century than what there is now. Uh, you know, this is not quite right. You know, I think this graph, which takes into account the entire tax system, not only the income tax, but the full tax system in the U.S., you know, it's pretty clear on the fact that there was a time of, of very strong effective tax progressivity. So we are, this is not statutory tax rate, okay? these are effective tax rate. So I think, uh, you know, that's important. If you have other uh, alternative series to this, you should put them online. But for the time being, this is what we have. And, uh, you know, it's clear that th there was a, a big tax progressivity. Now, regarding the tax, the, the growth rate, you know, coming back to this issue, you know, I just want to draw uh, your attention to this uh, graph. So you said, uh, Robert, that uh, the very high uh, growth rate of the 1950-1990 period was due to a sort of post-World War II effect. I, I really want to stress that this is not quite right. That, you know, if you look at the previous period, 1910-1950, or even the previous period, 1870-1910, you have roughly the same growth rate for national income per capita in the US, about 2%. So, you know, it was a bit more than 2% uh, 1950 to 1990. It was a bit less than 2% uh, 1870, 1910. So it increased a little bit. But, you know, what's, re what's really striking is the fact that 1990, 2020, it was only 1.1%. And that's very striking, especially, you know, as compared to the claims that were made in the 1980s, and, and these were, you know, ideological claim in the sense that this was a statement by Ronald Reagan that you will boost economic growth and innovation by lowering top income tax rate, which could have been right. You know, from a theoretical perspective, all ideologies are potentially plausible. But the thing is that, you know, the growth rate was divided by two. And when you compare such long period of time, uh, so, by the way, I'm not saying that the growth rate was divided by two. Why? The, because the top uh, marginal tax rate was also divided by two. You know, I think it's uh, it's not uh, it's not. I think again, the main reason for that uh, 
uh, is probably the stagnation of educational investment, which in the end is quite close to what you were describing. Uh, the fact that there's been a, a stagnation in a fraction of a generation uh, going to college, especially for young men. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is all about the US and, and, you know, of course, the US is a very interesting country, but, you know, it's only 5% of the world. And in the, in the book, I try also to talk about, uh, you know, how the inequality structure has changed in Sweden, in India, in China. And again, if you want to account for this whole diversity of experiences uh, across the world, across histories, and if you just come with uh, market forces, technology, you really, you're not going to go very far because all these countries, you know, have adopted such different sets of policies and institutions over time, which in the end are the primary determinant for all this change in inequality for, you know, good and bad reason. If you want to understand this change, you really have to look at politics, ideology, uh, institutional change. So that's, uh, you know, the general point I make. And, you know, I think this is true uh, uh, today. Uh, you know, you're not going to account for why Russian oligarchs today are very rich as compared to 30 years ago when there was no Russian oligarch in Soviet times, uh, just by your uh, technology and, you know, the superstar and the productivity of Russian oligarchs, you know, which I'm not sure is so high. So I think change in uh, ideology and change in the legal system uh, are going to be very important, you know, just to take this example to understand why things have changed the way they did in recent decades. Robert, rather than have you give a long reply to that, you can maybe fold it into the answer to, to my question. Uh, is COVID-19 going to have an impact on inequality? Well, yes. I mean, one of the things that, that is saddest about the impact of COVID-19 is that people like you and me and everybody else's picture that I see at the top of the screen and the people listening in can do much of what they do from comfortable isolation because of the nature of our jobs. Whereas people who are farther down the income distribution, who have different types of jobs, those, are, those jobs are disproportionately, they disproportionately involved interacting with other people on the factory floor or providing services in a store and things like that. And those people are, many of those people are going to lose their jobs, not just temporarily, but permanently. And when businesses close down, one of the tragedies is that people have built up a lot of specific, what economists would call specific human capital or skills that are specific to the particular occupation or business they work in. And on average, when those people were displaced from those jobs, you would think they go out, take a wage cut for a while, and then bounce right back, but they don't. If they've been in those jobs for a long time, say over 10 years, they lose about a third of their earning power. And that's a major impact that I don't think people are paying enough attention to um, in this crisis. So it's going to have a disproportionate impact farther down the earnings distribution, farther down the skill distribution. So but both of you, I mean, are the features of this pandemic and the unique sort of economic situation it's forced us into, are the features of this pandemic pandemic that should make us look at uh, policies like universal basic income or government guaranteed jobs, stuff that we might not have even contemplated six months ago that would be appropriate in these circumstances, bearing in mind that, bearing in mind that, you know, Jay Powell himself, you know, a, a Republican appointed chairman of the Fed has said that heaviest burden falls on those who are least able to bear it. He said that this weekend. Um, and that 42% of those who've lost their jobs, in America that is, I think the numbers are probably um, a little bit different in, in the Eurozone, but 42% of those who've lost their jobs are not likely to get them back. Should we be thinking out of the box to each of you this question? Well, you know, what I, what I see in history is that, you know, this kind of crisis uh, typically can change, to, can lead to big change in, uh, in you know, the dominant uh, discourse and ideology about, you know, the legitimacy 
well, certainly of public uh, uh, hospitals, public health system, and you know, I think in many countries and hopefully in the US as well, it will change you know, the belief system about you know, universal health care, investing in health, and certainly about income support system as well, which you just mentioned. And you know, I think in particular, in, we, we realize, you know, including in rich countries where we have pretty sophisticated system of income support, that you have big part of the labor force that are not adequately covered by uh, unemployment benefit, you know, lots of temporary workers, uh, self-employed <laughs> workers, which we have uh, encouraged a lot in recent uh, uh, decades and which now uh, you know have, have no have no support and have to go and work in the street and and at, at every risk now if we look at the south uh, uh, at the southern hemisphere you know it's even more critical and you know i think lockdown in india or in west africa when 90 percent of the workers are informal and have no income support you know it's something that that is not going to work and that is not working and and this, you know, we'll see, but it could be, you know, in some countries, it could accelerate the development of a sort of safety net system. And, you know, in the case of India, there was actually a long discussion uh, last year during the electoral campaign uh, with the Congress party and also low workers party to introduce a very basic income uh, scheme. And, uh, you know, six months before the election, it, it looked as if it could have, have won the election. Then the, you had the Kashmir uh, uh, terrorist attack and Modi was able to reframe the election in terms of Hindu-Muslim uh, uh, identity-based conflict and this was all gone. But we'll see, you know, what, what I see in history in my work is that often, you know, governments uh, then don't plan to, to do these things, you know, because of the extreme circumstances they are put into change their ideology in effect uh, in order to adapt to new challenges and, and do things that they, they would never have thought of, of doing. Public debt is going to be another big issue. You know, what do we do with public debt? And again, there are lots of examples in history of, of, you know, you have lots of surprise in history on how governments imagine new ways to deal with large public debt. Uh, I mean, I think that so the key message the markets took from Jay Powell um, was that debt is the last of last of our concerns right now? Is is that correct, Robert? And do radical times call for radical measures? Well, large catastrophes call for larger measures. I don't know if I'd call them radical. You know, the great economist Joseph Schumpeter, he of destruction. Now, this is destruction, but it's not very creative. Um, we see a lot of people being put out of work and their livelihoods, as I mentioned a bit ago, are gonna be severely damaged. And what Schumpeter said in that, in that context was, you know, we, we have to suffer the consequences, we have to suffer the defeat in some sense, but at least we can order, we can, uh, uh, order up an ordered retreat, uh, which is to say that the, the circumstances here probably warrant greater income transfers to, to certain people under certain circumstances. But one has to be wary of the, the tendency, as some on the left has sometimes called it, never waste a crisis in order to expand it into the types of policies that they'd like to have for the long run. This is not a long run problem. This is a, an immediate problem that requires a level of social insurance. And I think the institutions that we have are, are capable of providing it without transforming society in some way because of this of a, of a crisis that occurs a couple of times per century. Okay, let me ask each of you, because this is the Stigler Center and the annual conference was going to physically have taken place about competition, looking not just at the US economy and at the growth in concentration that we've seen across many sectors and many industries in America, um, but also Europe sort of renewed under the cloak of COVID, if you like, uh, enthusiasm for national champions and loss of appetite for competition policy. Um, uh, how big a role does concentration play in inequality and how important is it to have a much more stringent uh, competition policy, both sides of the Atlantic, uh, each of you? And, and Thomas, if you could incorporate your answer into you know criticisms of your book from people like Raghuram Rajan um, that you don't address that kind of thing. 
uh, that, that I, I don't address the role of, of very big economic player on inequality? Um, of competition policy, of, mm. of, of yeah. Um, from from Raghu, Raghu's review in the Financial Times, in fact. Yeah, I, uh, frankly, I don't know which part of the book he has read, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly agree, you know, who, who could disagree about the fact that, you know, the, the very high concentration uh, of corporate power in the you know, big giant tech industries uh, is playing a role, uh, you know, in the in the evolution of uh, of inequality. And but I, I would, I, you know, I want to stress, you know, it's competition policy and the fact that the U.S. Uh, as a country, you know, the U.S. federal government, you know, never updated its competition policy to this new uh, technology sectors, and you know, the politics and ideology of it sort of did not adapt to this new world. I think partly also because of the international competition. I mean, you could see it uh, also, uh, you know, many US presidents, whether Democrat or Republican, in the end feel that, you know, they have to protect their national uh, uh, giants. And so they don't want to, to do the, you know, the kind of, of, uh, of breakup and, and competition uh, uh, regulations that they, should, uh, that they should have been doing. But over and beyond the issue of, of antitrust, you know, there's also the issue of, of taxation and having a fair playing field. You know, we live in a world where uh, the largest corporations, uh, uh, you know, play, you know, pay an effective tax rate that is often below what small and medium sized companies are paying in their own country. And that's, that's not good. For for, uh, for, uh, for for the economy in general, that's not good for, for growth, that's not good for, uh, for equality, and that's not good for the sense of fairness that we need for people, you know, to, 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 to be okay with, uh, you know, the economic system and, and globalization. So this is something that will have uh, to change, you know, without breaking everything if possible, but, you know, at this stage, I see so many people who want to return to business as usual right away uh, that you know there's a risk that again the, the only uh, discourse that happens uh, that appears to be new as compared to the business as usual uh, uh, you know pro-market pro-business discourse is the kind of nationalist discourse that we've seen you know taken over us and british politics and also european politics uh, lately and you know there's a risk that this crisis in the end you know, on the one hand, it's going to reinforce the legitimacy of, uh, say, public uh, health uh, spending, public hospital. But on the other hand, it's also going to reinforce the, the, for some people, you know, the call for to close frontiers, to close borders, as the only, uh, you know, solution to, to, you know, regulate uh, uh, global uh, global capitalism. So. You know, if you, that's, if you look at pandemics in the past, you know, big pandemics in the past, I, 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 I refer to that a little bit at the beginning of my book. If you look at the Black Death episode, you know, it, it led to very different outcomes also in different parts of the world. You know, for a long time, you know, some economists believe the Black Death led to the end of serfdom and so, so on, more equality. But in fact, in some other areas, like in Eastern Europe, it led to the reinforcement of serfdom. So, you know, again, pure economic and technological factors do not determine a unique outcome. You know, it depends on the balance of power between groups, which is not only material, but also intellectual and, and ideological in terms of what worldview of the economy people are promoting. Thank you. Robert, competition policy? Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the role of antitrust policy or the lack thereof in looking at the evolution of inequality is vastly overstated. The, uh, the, the point of, anti of, of antitrust policy is to protect the competitive process. And some very good research by Larry Katz and David Otter and others has uh, provided compelling evidence, at least to me, that, um, that the, the, the sort of superstars aspect that I talked about um, briefly in my introductory remarks plays out in the marketplace at the level of the firm as well, that the most successful firms in a number of industries are the ones that have had the greatest increase in total factor productivity. They've attracted the, the, the most talented and productive workers. And yes, that can affect the wage distribution, but that doesn't mean the conduct that led, led to that, which, was, which is mainly comp competition on the merits, is anti-competitive. It might be a social concern, but it doesn't mean that it, that's, that it falls within the rubric, if you will, 
of antitrust policy. There are other policies that can address, be addressed to that. Now, it's true that in many cases, firms do engage in anti-competitive conduct in violation of either Section 1 or Section 2 of the, of the Sherman Act, are the main antitrust policies in the United States. And when that happens, we have the tools to enforce antitrust policy. So some might argue that we've moved away from enforcing it at the same level that we did before. But we have the tools and the outcomes that we see are not, in my opinion, the, the outcomes that, are, that follow from massive violations of antitrust laws. They're the competitive process at work. And sometimes we don't like certain aspects of how the competitive process uh, plays out. But again, I come back to that doesn't implicate antitrust policy. Um, okay, so we've got about uh, 10 or 11 minutes for questions for Q&A from uh, people who are watching. And there's a very good one here um, from Adam Zabner. Um, the United States is still dealing with the political and economic effects of bailing out the banks and not individuals from 2008. It seems like the same choice is being made this time. And I'm wondering what the effects of that will look like. I actually um, myself wrote about this the other day, a lot of, lot of good, timely, unlimited support from the Fed for big companies and for all kinds of debt holders. Um, a pretty patchy um, and box checking exercise for small businesses uh, and individuals, of course, getting late checks. It does seem to be asymmetric. If you were already doing well before the crisis, you're getting quick assistance. Um, if you're w one of the victims of the crisis, it's much slower uh, if, if it comes at all. Um, who would like to answer that question? Yeah, I can say a few words. You know, I think af we, after the 2008 financial crisis, you know, the balance sheet of both the Federal Reserve, the European Central Banks, and, and the biggest central banks in the world has expanded to an extent and with a rapidity that people would not have expected before. And, and, and now, you know, 12 years, so that was 2008. And now in 2020, you know, the very large segments of the public opinion have now understood, you know, how much has been done to sort of save the bank, save the financial sector. And I think, you know, there is a big and growing and legitimate demand, you know, to mobilize the same resources to fight the COVID and help, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, government, you know, invest in their, uh, in their, uh, in their health system, invest in the green transition, invest in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, you know, transportation infrastructure. And, you know, I think it's going to be very difficult to explain people, well, no, look, in, you know, in Europe, the, the, the balance sheet of the central bank has increased from 10 to 40% of GDP between 2008 and 2018. And I think, you know, today there's going to be a very large demand, you know, to, to use some of this, uh, uh, to, 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 to this possibility to raise resources, to do other kinds of investment. And I think, you know, things are changing, you know, just, uh, you know, if you are, uh, actually today, and, and there was also, also some, uh, there was some new announcement today by, by France and Germany to have a new plans to, to raise some common debt. And I think many things which looked impossible, uh, you know, could change in the, in the, in, you know, because of this crisis, you know, the, the, you know, again, I think it's very risky if we just do the same as what we did after 2008, which is in effect to boost the stock market and to boost real estate prices by the monetary uh, injections that we put in in order to stabilize, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, financial markets, you know, that's going to, that's going to be very difficult, uh, you know, many, many, many people, you know, in the, the you know, large segments of the of public opinion will really uh, uh, feel very negative about this. And I think that will be, you know, very, very risky uh, strategy. Okay, thank Ro Robert, do you want to briefly answer that or shall I, there are plenty of other questions. It's, uh, Why don't you go to the next question? Yeah, okay. So from Serge Ramin, interesting question. Um, given the fact that we're likely to have L-shaped recoveries here in the West, uh, do we expect COVID-19 is going to accelerate uh, the center of gravity from, from west to east? I would be surprised if that were the case. If anything, I think there's less 
cooperation or more suspicion between West and East. So um, this, this, this may be play out, especially with regard to China, this might play out as very damaging to China um, in terms of Western perceptions, whether those perceptions are accurate or not. Uh, so Carl Bushman asks, um, he says, Matthew Klein of Barron's argues that trade wars are coming thanks to the coronavirus and partly linking into your answer just now, Robert. To fix this or forestall these trade wars, should we close the wealth gap? You know, I, I think you sh we should use the, the, the threat of trade sanctions in order to move in the direction of more cooperation. So ju just to take an example, you know, if you, if you believe you should have a corporate tax rate of 30% and you're trading with a country that has 0%, the question is, what do you do? And I think, you know, one possibility is to say, well, look, you know, the, the companies that are based in the zero percent country, in effect, they have a tax deficit of uh, equivalent to 30 percent of their profit. So when they export goods and services to me, OK, they can do that. But, you know, I'm going to charge them this tax deficit. Now, the difference with the usual kind of tariff is that in case their, the government of country B raises their corporate tax rate up to 30%, then in effect, the tariff will disappear. So it's a very different from a, a standard kind of tariff where you want to have uh, you know, tariff as such. Here, here, I, but I, here the, the purpose you know, would be uh, to, to try to raise incentives in order so that uh, countries actually have an incentive to try to cooperate and, and especially regarding uh, tax dumping or social dumping or, you know, it can also apply to uh, environmental protection with, uh, you know, uh, carbon tax and, and uh, exports uh, coming from very high uh, carbon emission uh, uh, countries. But, you know, I, I think we have to move away from this view that, you know, either it's a zero percent tariff everywhere, you know, with no exception, uh, which is a bit crazy because at the very least, you know, you have some extra carbon emission coming from the international transportation. So at the very least, it should be taxed a little bit uh, if we care about carbon emission. So, you know, it's a little bit like uh, the religion of property in the 19th century. You know, you, you, you want to stay at zero percent because you're afraid that if you move away from there, you know, you will not where to, uh, where to stop, which, you know, I can understand, but it's a bit nihilistic. And I think we have to build some new... Uh, narrative and some new set of principles so that we actually know where to stop and we do this kind of, of uh, trade uh, uh, sanctions, you know, with a purpose, with a purpose tied to uh, building a more equitable tax system, being a more sustainable uh, future in terms of carbon emission. So we need to tie our trade policy to this specific social and environmental objective. Uh, Robert, did you want to pick that up, or shall I ask the next one? Uh, I'll just I'll just say that the, you know the connection between should we close the wealth gap and trade wars uh, basically it escapes me. There are many reasons why we might want to reduce inequality and in wealth, and then the next question was how should you do it through redistribution or through efforts to to in, increase people's ability to acquire human capital and save and things like that, but tying it to trade wars doesn't seem to me to be a good idea. It's that it comes back to that never waste a crisis kind of mentality that I mentioned earlier. I think, I mean, to be fair, Danny Roderick and others have written quite a lot about how uh, where, when there's great inequality and job losses, globalization tends to be scapegoated. Um, so I don't think it's- from That's certainly true. That's certainly true. Um, let me ask you another one though. Um, uh, and Robert, let me just direct this at you, uh, but, but, but Thomas can pick it up. Um, Yang Jiang um, asks, how does the recent um, uh, rise in stock prices in the stock market, in the midst of all the sort of general macro despair, how do you explain that? What, what, what are the stock markets seeing uh, that, that the rest of us aren't? Well, if I knew a precise answer, I'd be richer than I am now because I'd understand the way that that's that's gone. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm less optimistic than the market appears to be, certainly. But you know, we always have to keep in mind that the the stock market, the returns on shares, 
are the expected present value of future profitability. So they, they are seeing evidently a brighter future than many of us are seeing. The immediate circumstances affect immediate returns, but a stock price in, in, embeds the entire future of returns. And so, you know, things can be going bad today and the stock market can be going up. I, I, I rarely borrow from Paul Krugman, but he has a, a chant that he uses sometimes that says, the stock market is not the economy. The stock market is not the economy. The stock market is not the economy. And so I'll say, the stock market is not the economy. Message received. Uh, unfortunately, we've only got a minute or two left. And so I'm, I'm gonna ask the, what will probably be the concluding question to Thomas, or, or rather ask somebody else's. Um, from Nicola Lassetera, Las I'm not quite sure um, if I'm pronouncing correctly. It's, it's a good esoteric continental intellectual kind of, kind of question, so you might appreciate it, Thomas. Would Professor Piketty think of himself as more of a Gramscian than a Marxian because of it, his stress on cultural and ideological factors? Are you more of a Gramscian? Yes, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm doing. The, I guess the difference with uh, with uh, also like Marx or Gramsci is that what what I'm doing is very you know data intensive. You know, they, they also because you know it's not that they didn't have the idea of collecting data. It's because it's much easier today to collect data. So you know what I do in my work is first to try to quantify uh, you know the long run evolution of inequality across. Uh, uh, you know, several dozen countries, you know, now in the world inequality database, uh, we have, we, we cover, uh, you know, most of the world. And what's new in this book is that I also try to collect, uh, idea, uh, you know, data on ideology and in particular electorate. You know, I try to answer a simple question, who votes for which uh, political platform and political parties and why has this changed over time? And I compare not only US, Western European democracies, but also India, Brazil, and I think it's important because all the discussion we're having, like for instance in the US about how the Democratic Party has lost touch with the working class are so much US centered, you know, I think and it's a big problem with, uh, with discussion in the US, if I may, in general. And I think, you know, there's a lot to learn by comparing many different countries together and to see that some evolution which we see as typically, uh, you know, US, you can find the same in countries that didn't have at all, say, the civic right movement in the US in the 60s. So you need for better explanation. And so, you know, I'm more Gramscian in the sense that I put more emphasis of ideology, in, if you want. But the way I do it, you know, it's so much more based on sort of quantitative uh, social science that it's, uh, it's hard to, to, you know, to, to compare to, to, this, uh, to this former and previous uh, authors. Well, uh, Gramsci famously said, um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, let's optimistically hope that there will physically be a, 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 a conference next, next year um, uh, in Chicago at the Stigler Center. Yep. For, for in terms of this session this year, um, thank you very much to both of you. We covered a lot of ground, a lot of quite dense ground, um, and uh, I learned a lot. So thank you very much to, to you to Luigi Zingale, Simone, um, Sebastian, and the Stigler Center, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.